Hey guys, today we're going to wrap up our lectures on evolution, discussing some of the mechanisms of evolution. So we're going to talk about two ways that evolution can take place, or two modes that can lead to evolution. And here are two theories that we're going to talk about. The first is called gradualism, and the second one is called punctuated equilibrium. Now, gradualism is a mode of evolution that takes quite a long, slow, methodical period of time, while Punctuated equilibrium is much more shorter and uh, more rapid changes occurring. As I just said, guys, gradualism is when these populations are going to slowly change over gradual steps over extremely long periods of time. You can see here, this is really similar to exactly how we've been describing evolution from the start of this. And you can see that this one species of butterfly slowly evolved into two different species and we know at the end that those are going to be two separate species because they can no longer reproduce with each other and that's going to be something that we kind of talk a little bit more about as far as separating those two species. Punctuated equilibrium on the other hand is when rapid spurts of genetic change cause species to evolve very quickly and in between these spurts there's very little change. Now, a lot of times this can happen because one of these genetic changes provides a real advantage in the environment as opposed to the normal or more typical um, genetic sequences that are seen and phenotypes that are seen. So again, punctuated equilibrium, these rapid changes, and you might see two, even three different species um, occur from these. One of the things that can cause punctuated equilibrium as well is, or at least magnify it, is the environment. And if the environment suddenly changes, we might see these rapid spurts of changes that are occurring in these populations and eventually um, could lead to these new species. So next we're going to learn about how populations evolve over time. And it's really important to remember that populations are the ones that are evolving, not individuals. Individuals can't evolve themselves. We can't change anything about our genetics. And we've explained that populations evolve over time. And here's some explanations on how this happens. The first is gene flow. Um, and that's basically how the genetic mutations, or, or sorry, these genetic traits are going to be passed down from one generation to the next. Another is non-random mating. So is there a tra an attractiveness between in the species that where one mate will prefer mating with another? Um, this can lead to really cool features like antlers on a deer or feathers on a peacock or other patterns um, and colors. For example, the bright color of the cardinal or the mane of the lion. Next, we have mutation. So mutation would be these random changes in the genetic traits uh, of these individuals. Maybe we see a new phenotype, and that could have an advantage over other individuals. Natural selection, where we talk about some organisms being more fit for the environment than other individuals. And lastly, we have geographic isolation. Geographic isolation would be when we have a population of organisms that has suddenly been isolated, maybe by a flood or some sort of geographic barrier, but because they can no longer get to each other, they are no longer going to be able to exchange their genes. So because of that, whatever the traits are that are in each population, th these two populations are now going to evolve separately, and those traits are going to stay on either side. So we'll talk more about each of them. So gene flow is the first one. Gene flow would be individuals in a population moving in. Um, we call that immigration when they're moving in with an I. And emigration is with an, spelt with an E. And we call that um, when they're exiting the population. Now, when an organism is going to do that, an individual, they're bringing with them their genetics. So, for example, if somebody came into a population with some traits that nobody else had in that population, well, now that trait is in the gene pool. And this is just as effective as um, a mutation occurring in that gene pool. Now that trait could be passed down to the next generation. And this random movement causes more genetic diversity, which is always good. We're always looking for diversity when we're talking about uh, organisms because it gives them the best chance to survive. So when we're talking about nature, individuals usually mate with others that live in close proximity to each other. 
This is because it, these organisms have to meet together in order to mate. Um, and because of this, this promotes inbreeding and individuals passing on the same traits generation after generation. When describing non-random mating, it's important to remember too that there might be something that um, one of these organisms, whether it's male or female, finds attractive in the other. And because of that, it could lead to really cool features. For example, like the ones we mentioned, the lion's mane or deer's antlers. Um, it could be something physical, but it could also be something behavioral. Um, in a lot of cases, we see that some organisms perform a courtship dance where they try to attract a mate. In others, they might compete with other males in order to show to these females that they are the strongest and the most fit and that those are the traits and the genes that they want to pass down to their offspring. Um, others could be really good at building nests or um, in some cases like penguins, for example, there are certain species of penguins that um, give a pebble to their, their future spouse. And so there are a lot of different um, mating behaviors and um, stuff like that and when it comes to non-random mating. So we'll talk about some more in class. Next is mutation. And mutation is a random change in the genetic material. And this could be bad, it could be harmless, or it could give this organism an advantage over it, the others in its environment and give it a better chance at surviving. If you look at this moth, for example, and this was the same peppered moth example that you guys saw in your evolution web quest, you'll see that the speckled moth really sticks out in this environment. But the black moth really blends in with the bark here and clearly has an advantage. So the first one that had that mutation was able to blend in, survive really well, and able to reproduce and pass those traits down. Well, over time, we're going to see more of those black colored moths because they blend in better with the environment. Next is natural selection, and natural selection we've already talked about quite a bit, so I'm just going to quickly explain through it one more time. So this is when nature selects the best individuals to survive and pass on their traits to offspring. Only the individuals best suited for their environment will pass on these traits, and the others, as we pointed out, will die off and unable to, be, to pass on their traits. Lastly, guys, we have geographic isolation. And again, this is when a species is separated by some sort of geographic barrier. And they'll continue to evolve separately in these separate locations because they are unable to exchange their genes with each other because this barrier has now prevented them from getting to one another. As we just said, as they evolve, they're going to continue to gather more and more traits that differ. And eventually, these species will become two complete different species. This is called speciation. And you can see here that it's occurred here with these two different types of squirrels. The last thing we'll do is introduce two different types of evolution. And the first is coevolution. There are many species that have evolved in very close relationships to one another, and many evolve together as they benefit one another. Some examples are this moth and the comet orchid. Well, the comet orchid can only be pollinated by this one type of moth, and it's because it has evolved with the moth um, to have this long, long shape where its nectar is deposited. And what this does, it provides the moth with a, with a food source, but also allows the flower to be pollinated. Um, and because these moths really enjoy these flowers, they specifically are going to be great at transporting the pollen from these comet orchids from one plant to the next. So only the moths with the largest or the longest mouths, in this case, were able to reach the nectar. And in this case, the flowers that had the deepest wells were able to make sure that they weren't pollinated with um, other types of pollen, but they were pollinated just by the specific type um, that the moth or the species of moth enjoyed. And if you looked here, it's really similar to the buff-tailed sicklebill and the centropogon flowers. You can see here that the shape of the sicklebill fits perfectly with the shape of that flower in a really similar example. Another example of coevolution could be with predator and prey. For example, cheetahs. The fastest cheetahs are the ones that will catch the gazelles. So they evolve to be the fastest because only the fastest cheetahs are going to be the ones to survive. The slower ones can't eat. And they are going to be unable to survive. 
Now, the gazelles, the fastest gazelles are going to be the only ones that survive. And the slower ones, they're the ones that get caught and get eaten. So what we see is that this relationship between the two, the, the cheetah gets faster and then the gazelle gets a little faster. And what, what happens is both of these animals have become some of the fastest organisms in their ecosystems. So the next type of evolution is convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is a strange effect where organisms who don't share a similar common ancestor are going to evolve to have similar features. And this is caused because they live in similar environments that require the same functions. You can see here that these different types of marsupials, and marsupials are mammals that are found only in the country or on the continent of Australia. And you can see here that they have evolved to look very similar to organisms that are placental mammals, mammals that do not share a closely related common ancestor. Yet when you look at all of these organisms, they've evolved very similar features. For example, the marsupial mole and the mole have evolved to burrow deep underground. And the numbat it eats ants as well as the anteater. So their long snout and long tongue are, allow them to collect the ants and prey on them very easily. Um, lemurs and spotted couscous have long tails and spotted patterns that allow them to camouflage as well as uh, climb trees. Flying phalangiers and flying squirrels have basically webbed uh, arm to legs that allow them to glide from tree to tree. And you can see some similarities in the other organisms as well. Now, single dream gene traits, some traits are controlled by just a single gene and we have two different possibilities. And an allele can have a very powerful effect on selection. And a perfect example is the peppered moth example that you guys saw on your web quest. If you look, the, the moths that blend into one environment might not blend into the other. And what this leads to is two completely different species. This is because each set of moths is successful in its own environment. The darker moths blend in better with the darker environment of the tree, while the pepper moth is able to blend in with the lichen that is growing on the tree. So both successful in their own way, but in separate parts of the environment. This is really important because if there was a moth that was a color in between these two, well, it wouldn't be at an advantage at all. In fact, it wouldn't be able to fit into either one of these environments. And that moth would likely be eaten. So only the moths that fit in exactly like either one of these environments on either extreme, either really light and speckled or really dark, are going to be the ones that are selected for it in this example. Polygenic traits, we talked about a little bit when we mentioned genetics. These are traits that are controlled by many alleles. So uh, an example of that is height. When you look at someone, they are not either six foot or five foot or four foot. No, they're all of these in-between heights, right? And that's because there are many different alleles that control the height of humans. And so a lot of times when we graph these, we see that there's a normal distribution, a bell curve, if you may. And we see that the average has quite a lot of individuals. The majority of people fall within that average, where if you go on either extreme, either really, really tall in this case, or really, really short, then there are very few people that fit into those criteria. So there are three modes of selection in which natural selection can affect the phenotype of the next generation with these polygenic traits. And they're called directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. Directional selection is going to favor individuals that are at one end of the phenotypic range. And this is most common during times of environmental change. For example here, you had uh, here in blue the normal distribution for the size of beaks in a type of bird. Well, what happened was after a drought, the seeds became very hard. So the only birds that were able to survive were the ones that had really strong, large beaks in order to crack those seeds. Well, if you look here, this red chart below that now shows the new distribution, where now the average bird has a much larger, stronger beak. And that's because the ones who had the smaller, weaker beaks died out. Stabilizing selection is going to favor individuals right in the middle, and it's going to favor against the individuals on the extremes. An example of this is human birth weights. It's not good to be too heavy for the mother to give birth, and it's not good to be too light for the baby. 
And lastly, disruptive selection is the one we talked about with the peppered moths, where it's going to select against the individuals in the middle and favor those individuals on the extremes. Those are going to lead to a completely new species.